Crosby. I'm sure you'd be used to uplifting of God's kingdom. This morning I'd like to read just a few verses real quickly before Brother Joe brings the message. Uh, turn to Leviticus with me, if you will, and follow along. I may make a mistake, not mean to, but may read something wrong. Uh, chapter 26. We'll start with the third verse. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and you shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid, and I will rid evil beasts out of the land. Neither shall the sword go through your land, and ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. And ye shall eat the old store, and bring forth the old because of the new. And I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people and I am your Lord the Lord your God which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt that ye shall not be their bondmen and I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go upright we see here by being obedient all these blessings that bestowed upon Israel here God had laid all the commands you can read all through the whole book of Leviticus and you know, Probably a little bit of Exodus as well. And you can read all the rules and regulations they had to follow. And by being obedient, they was instantly blessed here with more with rain, due season, their yield increased. Everything went well for them because God lived with them and they lived with God. And then we go on to verse 14, it says, But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul will bore my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, break that ye break, but that ye break my covenant, I will also do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ague that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of the heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies that they hate you shall reign over you and you shall flee when none pursueth you and if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me then I will punish you seven times more for your sins and I will, will break the pride of your power and I will make you your heaven as iron and your earth as brass and your strength shall be spent in vain for your land shall not yield her increase neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits and if you walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, and destroy your cattle, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if ye will not be reformed by me, by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered unto the hand of the enemy. And when I have broken the staff of the bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat, and not be satisfied. And if ye will not, for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins, and ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. And I will destroy your high places, cut down your images, and cast your carcasses 
upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. And I will make your cities waste, and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. And I will not smell the sweet savor of your sweet odors. And I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which will dwell therein will be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemies' land. Even then shall the land rest, and enjoy her Sabbath. As we read here, you know, there's penalties for being disobedient. Again, that they broke the laws, all these things would happen. And so many times today, we don't realize that's the kind of God we, just, we serve. We, because we don't see this kind of stuff happen today, not very often do we see instant blessings. Not very often do we see the instant judgments. People sin. And we look around, we see somebody sitting down a road here, maybe a drunk driver, and we wonder, why did he kill this Christian? Why did he kill all these innocent people? Why is all this going on? Why, where's the, where's the, where's the judgments? And we get... We just don't understand it. If we read in uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's why it happened. And we don't see it instantly because the Lord, he's not slack like we would count it. We think he's being slack, but no, he's not doing that. He wants all to come to repentance and not perish by doing the things he's told us to do, by hearing of the word, believing, repenting, confessing him to one another, being baptized with him and buried with him in baptism and enduring to the end. Remember these things and make sure we get it right and study the word. And follow God and be obedient because one day there's going to be a judgment day and we're going to get what He promised us. Whether we're living according to His word, when we get heaven, we live disobedient to Him, we end up in hell. Father Joe, the message. Thank you, Brother Bill. I'd like to thank the Lord again for another day. He's given me this opportunity to come out and stand before you. If you come out today expecting the just uh, hear one of Brother Tommy's uh, messages. Come back next week. Maybe he'll be back. We switched out this month. So I'm supposed to be on the third and he's on the second. So. But anyway, uh, he'll be back next week and you'll get to put up with me today. Uh, we decided this about a week or two ago. Uh, I'll be bringing it up on the second of this month. And I've been trying to put something together knowing this is getting up pretty close to the uh, anniversary date of February, or March the 2nd of last year, and, and I thought I would tie something back to, along with the Old Testament and stuff, but evidently the Lord didn't want me to do that. He had me, a, he, I just couldn't get anything brought together in my mind. He didn't give me <coughs> nothing to bring together to match all that up, so I'm going to worry about that. He's, uh, he's got me what he wants me to speak of this morning, and that's what I'm going to try to speak of. I'm going to leave it in his hands to give us a message that we all hopefully will need here. Uh, I like to think myself as a simple person. Uh, complicated things seems to, to frustrate me a little bit. And, and uh, I have a hard time. I can figure things out somewhat. But see me like I have a hard time when it gets very complicated. So I like to think of myself as being a simple-minded person. Uh, I've talked to this several people at different times down through the years. Uh, past you know, in workplaces and this and that. And, and I've met a lot of different people in a lot of different areas. And they somehow or another have a hard concept of why we here, or not just here at Lacey Creek, but the Church of Christ in general, do the things we do. Um, the last sermon I had last month on the third Sunday I remember that I was talking mostly about, and that's something I don't remember a lot of, is the sermons I get up here, and it may sound strange to you, but when I throw a sermon out right here, normally I go over to the prison at Sandy Hook, and I give another sermon. And you can ask Brother Dan. They don't always come out the same, and I come out with the same passages. That's the Lord's way of working. 
and I don't have to understand it, but that his message gets out is what's important, and that we stick with his word. And I've talked to different people, well, why do you do things that you do? And sometimes I can't understand, maybe this, this message is for me. Sometimes I don't understand why I do some of the things I do until I get back in God's word, and, and I understand and realize when he shows it to me. Uh, I've talked to people. Why do we speak on baptism so much? Last month I done a sermon on what it meant for <clears throat> baptism. If he is here, it was. It's important. It's part of. It's no more important than any of the rest of it. But is it? It is important. It's part of it. Well, about four o'clock this morning, like I said, I, I was struggled this whole week trying to find something, and it just wouldn't come out. I woke up about four o'clock this morning, and he said, Joe. You need to speak something. Now, he didn't say this audibly. This is just something come to my mind. He didn't get down and shake me, nothing like that. I normally wake up around 4 o'clock all the time, but he would go back to sleep, so I wake up. And I've got on my mind that uh, you need to speak a little bit of why you do communions every week. So I sort of puzzled with my mind a little bit, and I went back to sleep. I wake back up a few minutes later, maybe half an hour or so, and it's still on my mind. I need to speak something Why we do communion every week. Here in Lacey Creek, I like to think that we go back as close as we can get to way, to way and when the church was established. Why do we come together on the first day of the week? Why do we do communion every week? I've had people tell me, why, you're just doing it, it's just going to be a habit? For a Christian, that shouldn't be a habit. For a Christian, the communion that we take every week should be something very dear to us as an individual. It's not a habit. Yeah, we come together. Sunday's, Sunday's the Lord's Day. Well, I've got a few verses. I didn't figure I have a whole lot of time. Uh, it's hard to do in 15 minutes what needs to be brought out. There's a whole lot more passages in the Bible that I'm not going to be bringing bearing out to you, but I've got a few that he's picked out for me this morning, and I want to read them. I want to start out in Acts chapter 20, at verse 7. Follow along with me, because I can misspeak words. I'm only human. Uh, I think in Sunday school this morning, uh, we got a little bit into deacons and elders and things in the, in the church. Why do we have it? Because God instituted them. There's a reason for elders in the church. There's a reason for deacons in there. Read your Bible. You can figure it out. I haven't got time this morning to read all that and explain it all. But it's in His Word. We stay as close to His Word as we can. I may not agree on one set of scriptures that you agree on, but through us together we can make the understanding a little bit clearer for the both of us. That's the unique thing of God's Word. The message I give today here, when I go over to the prison in about an hour and a half, may be totally different, but I'm probably going to use about basically the same scriptures. And I'll use some of the same words. But for whatever reason, God handles it. I accept it, and that settles it for me. It may not for anybody else, but it does for me. I cannot, and like I said, I'm simple-minded. I've tried to go from starting tomorrow, try to get a message for next month when I come up on the 3rd. Seems me like every time I do that, I have problems. If this is just me speaking of me right now. I mean, I'm not in the Bible just yet. It's me speaking. Seems like I have more trouble trying to study. But if I get the last week, and sometimes it gets down to Saturday night, and I still don't have nothing. But I leave it in his hands. I said, Lord, I do what you want me to do. You just show me the way. And it's worked out so far. He's not let me down yet. I think I've let him down a few times, but he's not let me down yet. So in Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. That is one verse that tells us that on the first day of the week. That's why we do it. The apostles did it. Why should we do any different? They're the one that sets things in order. That's Jesus taught them. These men walked with Jesus. And he taught them what to do. So they done it on the first day of the week. 
That's why we do it on the first day of the week. Let's go over in John chapter 20. I'm going to jump just a little bit here back and forth. John chapter 20, 17 through 30. Let's look at this here. There's, there's something about this first day of the week. I, I, I advise you to back up and read more of this. I haven't got enough time here to read everything I'd like to read to you, so back up and read more of this verse and go on down further. But starting with the 17th verse in John chapter 20, it says, And Jesus said unto her, Touch me not. Now this is just after Jesus uh, was uh, resurrected. He came up forth when he was supposed to. <laughs> Actually, if you back up, or I need to back up, or if you go up on in the first verse of chapter 20, it says, The first day of the week came with Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, into the sepulcher, and see if the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Now I want to jump down to 17. It says, And Jesus, and, and Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day of the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, for the disciples were assembled for fear. Listen here. The disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, and came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. They was assembled together again on the first day of the week. Now let's read on down through here real quickly. And when he had and when he had so said, he shooed unto them his hands and his side. Then there, then there, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I, or send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his, in his hands the prints of the nails, and put my fingers in the prints of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after, listen to this now, and after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the door being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Eight days later, you count up your weeks. you got Sunday, you've got seven days. The eighth day later, you've got Sunday, you've got your first day of the week again. There's something to this first day of the week. I think as... We, being Christian, we should relate to that first day of the week, and we should do things accordingly, as he had planned. We need to get as close to as we can to the first day of the week to do what he wants us to do. And I don't see anything right now that should interfere with us doing that. Um, about a, no, back in October, I changed jobs again. So I'm able to be here on the first day of the week. When my job was what required me because of sick people and needed my services, I had to miss once every other week. I was here every other week. There's reasons we can't be here. But there's also reason we need to be here. It's part of what Bill was saying a while ago. We need to do what the Lord wants us to do. And we need to go to His Word and find out how we are to be doing those things. And why we're doing them. There's a reason why we do them. It should not be a habit for this communion. It should be something that we should be looking forward to, to commune with our Lord on the first day of the week. Revelations chapter 1, verse 10. I think it speaks to John. I reached the I didn't mark it to, to read, but I'm going to go ahead and jump over and read it anyway. I think it's a little more pl uh, plainer if it's read. It's not just my word. It says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. As you start in the Revelations backyard, what John was getting ready to go through and see, he said, I was in the Spirit of the Lord's, of the Lord's day. And that referenced me back to the first day of the week again. That's what we call Sunday, the Lord's day, the first day of the week. There's a significance to this first day of the week and why we do what we do. Why we have elders, why we have deacons, 
Why are we set things in order as we do? Why are we not jumping up? So, well, there ain't no spirit in that church up there. There ain't nobody hollering. ain't nobody screaming. ain't nobody jumping up and running up and down the aisles. There's no spirit there. Don't tell me there's no spirit here. I can feel it in my heart. Amen. Today, we don't have to do confusion stuff. Why get confused? As Brother Dan told me one time, he went to some kind of rock and roll service one time. He said the spirit was there so big his hair stood up on the back of his neck. Yeah, he was in the spirit, but he said, I don't think it was the Lord's spirit. Once he understood what it was. <clears throat> this is what I'm saying. I'm a very simple-minded person. God's got a very simple plan for salvation. The difficult comes when it's time to live. If we don't stay in his word, if we want to go ahead and close our Bibles up and Lay them over to the side and forget about it. I'm a Christian now. I'm ready to go, Lord. Stand me out there into this world. Guess what? You're going to be cut down. You're going to be cut down hard. Satan is going to make a havoc of your life. Upside and down. Every which way. Any way he can gouge. He's going to be gouging. When you do, you decide to get your Bible back out and you start reading. As Bill said a while ago. If they would stay, if Israel would have stayed where they supposed to, they had a lot of promises and a lot of riches and a lot of things that happened good for them. If they did not stay where they supposed to, they had a lot of havoc. They had a lot of diseases. They had a lot of trouble. They had a, heart, a lot of heartaches, a lot of sorrow. I'm not saying as a Christian you're going to go through this life without sorrow. No, no way am I telling you that because you will have sorrow. In this life, we will have tribulation. James told us that in his words in the Bible. The inspired word that uh, God has given to the good men to write in this book, we are going to have heartaches and troubles and trials in this life. That is part of us getting ready for the next life. But don't let people tell you you're just doing things out of habit. No, we're going to get as close as we can. Are we going to falter sometimes? Yes. Am I going to falter? Yes. But I'm going to stay as close as I can to God's Word and do the things He wants me to do on the first day of the week. I may have times that I have to go ahead and uh, uh, be off on a Sunday. I may have some other uh, uh, things that comes up. But my priority is going to be here on Sundays. And any other times I can make it here through the week that we have services and where I can get together with people with like minds. That is what God wants us to do. If I do nothing but fill my mind after I become a Christian, I do nothing but fill my mind with the way the world thinks, Satan is going to destroy me. Satan is going to destroy you. That's what he wants you to believe. That's what he wants you to think. I've had people that ask me other things in the Bible in different areas. Well, why do you do this? Why, or why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? Well, it's in the Bible. I said, well, if it's something we should be doing, we will do it. But there's in ways and for, uh, in places, and there's ways and way we do things. We don't force <coughs> ourselves up on no one. Brother Tommy uh, mentioned the other day, and, uh, and I'm sure he doesn't care for us to start talk about it because he mentioned it. He called for the elders to come and pray for him. So we did that because he asked. Now, when I find out that somebody's sick and I run it, we, do we elders run into somebody's house and force our way in there? We're going to pray for you. We know you're in bad shape. No, we're not going to do that because that's not the way it's done. He says they are to call the elders and then we go and anoint. There's a way of doing things, the way God set it forth for us to do it. Christ never forced himself on anyone. We have no right to do that. We read in the Sunday school this morning, we do not lordship over no one. That is not our job. We are to work together, men and women, for the Lord as Christians, according to his word as close as we can. Why do we do the things we do? We should be able to go back to the Bible and explain it to a person if they don't understand it. I've not always been able to do that. And I still may not be able to do that in certain spots. But guess what? I've got good brothers and sisters in Christ. If I don't understand, I can go to them and I can ask them. I don't understand this passage. Can you help me with it? I've got a Lord that I can go to in prayer. When I need it bad enough, He'll give it to me. He's done it for me. 
I've had good brothers and sisters in Christ that has done that for me. Because we're coming out of the same place, out of the same book, out of the same scriptures that was inspired by God through righteous men that we can look at today. So there's a reason we do things here. There's a why we do things and how we do things. It's according to his word. And if I'm not doing it the right way, then somebody needs to come to me and say, Joe, I don't think you're doing that right there. And if I can't, exceed, uh, if I can't explain it, and if you can show it to me, then I'll change my ways. I don't need to be tossed by every wind and doctrine. It warns us about that. I may go down here to work tomorrow. And I may meet somebody in another congregation that thinks altogether different than I do. And I, they may have some good things going on. They may say how much they've done this. They've helped so many do that. They went and done this. And they went and done that. And then all may be good. And they say, now I believe we need to do this. And if it's contrary to God's word, even know how good they've been. And I thought, well, you know, you are a good person. Maybe I better listen to some of the things you say. If it's contrary to God, I better not be listening to them no matter how good a person they are. And I think that's what the world's are seeing today. Is too many peoples out there is good, honest, upright people, but yet not obeying exactly what God said or let something else be added to it. If you go back to the Revelations, I think we've come across that before. I know it's come across in this pulpit, and I can't remember whether I've done it or not. But if we add to or take from His Word, it's going to be added to us or taken from us. Just as Brother Bill was saying a while ago back in Leviticus about Israel. If they didn't do the, and be obedient to the statutes that God had put out for them, things was going to happen. Some of it, if they stayed with them, was going to be good. And if they didn't stay with it, it was going to be bad. This is the point I'm trying to make today. We have reasons and why we do things in the way we do them here. And any church of Christ throughout the world, don't have to be in the United States, throughout the world, wherever they're at, I hope and pray they're doing the same thing. All churches, if it's the church, the true church of God should be going back to God's Word and staying as close to it as they possibly can. I'm not saying it's wrong to have Thursday night Bible studies. It's a good thing to have Thursday night Bible studies. It's a good thing to have a Monday night Bible study. A Tuesday night Bible study, a Wednesday night Bible study, a Friday night Bible study, a Saturday night Bible study. Everything's good the more we can learn of what God wants us to do and to be. It's all good. But we are commanded not to forsake the sending of ourselves together. It also says that in the Bible. Now, the first day of the week is when they assemble. I've already went through about three passages already that's showing that. And there's more than that in there. <coughs> now, as far as communion, you know, I'm already running over time. I want to read through real quickly. Bill already read Matthew 26, so I'll not read it. I'm going to read Mark real quickly. And I didn't have enough time to do what I wanted to do today, but I went to where he wants me to go to, evidently. Mark chapter uh, 14. 22 through 25 real quickly. And as he did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave to them and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day which I drank, drank it new in the kingdom of God. That was with the disciples there. Luke, same deal. I'm not going to read that one. Go in there. Luke, chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. You can find where he done it with the disciples again. Now I want to go to the one that I like to read the most because it explains it to me better. I wanted to have a little more time on this, but the Lord decided he didn't want me to, so I'm just going to read it real quickly down through there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, starting with uh, 23rd verse. Well, I'm going to back up or I'm going to back up the 17th verse. Because the people of Corinth didn't understand what was going on. This is what I want to try to explain. It. There's a reason why we do things. It says, Now in this that I declare unto you that I praise you not that ye come together not for the better but for the worse. Now this is Paul writing to the Corinthians. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies 
among you, that they which are of truth may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, unto one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before others his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. This is Paul right to the Corinthians. The Corinthians didn't understand. They hadn't fully understood what was needing to be implemented here. That's the reason I think that we are getting more closer to the Lord as we keep studying more. For I received the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, take bread. We read about that in the four Gospels. And when he had given thanks, he broke and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. That's what they're doing. And after the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you do it, he didn't say do it every week. But when did he tell us to assemble? It was a weekly thing. That's when the disciples do it. Shouldn't we not be the same? We ought to go back to the closest we can get to when it was first established. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you be shown the Lord's death till he comes. You remember what our Lord did for us when we partake of these every week. Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, listen to this one now, unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. It's unworthily. Not that I'm worthy to partake of it to begin with. I'm probably not worthy to partake of it for, to begin with. Well, I'm pretty sure I'm not worthy. But I can, through the grace of God and through the study of His Word, I can take it in a worthy manner. And that's what I need to do, to take it in a worthy manner. Have I had things that things have bothered me this week that made me think wrong? Yes. Am I proud of it? No. <clears throat> but by the grace of God, I can get through it and I can get stronger. With his help and good brothers and sisters in Christ to help me along the way, we can together get through this life and we can make it. If times gets tougher, we can get stronger. We get closer. Things will get easier. But if we don't open up God's Word and we don't assemble ourselves together, things is going to get tougher and tougher and tougher and tougher. And we're going to hurt worse and worse and worse. Open up God's word, I advise you. Let's do it as close as they did when they first, when it was first established back in the first century of the church. Back when the uh, uh, the apostles were sent out. Back when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was crucified and he went back to God. He went back. He done what he needed to do here on earth. He told us. He told the disciples and the apostles what they must do and what they need to do to spread his name about his crucifixion. We're still remembering that today on a weekly basis. Should be on a daily basis. But we're doing it as a congregation on a weekly basis, and it should be mean just as much today as it did last week or next week or a year from now or a hundred years from now if the Lord tarries His coming. It should mean just as much to us from the day we started to the day we give up our life upon this earth. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as Brother Bill said a while ago, He went to the old rugged cross with no guile, no sin, not nothing found in His life, but yet He went and was hung on an old rugged cross so that we could have this opportunity of salvation. So that we can have a life where there is no heartaches, no troubles, no uh, anguish, no problems. But it's not in this life we're going to find it. It's in the life to come. We'll sleep for a little while. And after that we'll wake to the most glorious place that we can't even imagine. But yeah, we've got description of it. I think Brother Eric here a few months back spoke of it. Of how wonderful that place must be that we have an opportunity to go to only, only if we keep the ordinances of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what He has told us. Only if we can do to our best of our abilities the things He wants us to do and the things He wants us to be. And we love each other and we help each other. Are we going to falter? Yes. Are we going to be proud of it? No. But we can do it. Through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we can have eternal life when this life is over. And we can have a life that we cannot even imagine right now. 
we see through a glass through a uh, glass darkly. Just a just a little bit of some of the finest stuff that we have on this earth is not even not even a speck of what it will be like one of these days when Jesus comes back to redeem the ones that has been faithful to him. You've got that opportunity today. Bill went through the steps before he goes before he turned the service over to me. Of what you need him to become a Christian. Number uh, 567, if you understand. Is my name written there? I can answer that question. Have you done the things it takes? You've got that opportunity this morning to get your name written there. As we sing. Number 567.